Hare Om Namaha Om Hare Vidas Yan Mama Sarvarakshang Nias Tangri Padmaha Padagendra Prishte Durari Chamasi Gadesha Chapa Pashanthano Ashtagano Ashtabahu Oma Gyana Timirandhasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militan Yena Tasmai Shri Shri Gurave Namaha I offer my respectful obeisances unto my Guru Maharaj, Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, who has opened my eyes, which were closed with the darkness of ignorance, with the torchlight of knowledge. What is today's question? How is the ancient knowledge of Krishna consciousness still applicable in the postmodern world for today's genuine spiritual seeker of the absolute truth? It's a good question. The knowledge of disciplic succession comes from time immemorial, starting from the universal creator, Lord Brahma, as the head of the Sampradaya, or disciplic succession. But it is best encapsulated by a recent acharya in our line, our school, our Sampradaya. His name is Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, and he was prominent during the second half of the 19th century. Actually, one of his books was the first manuscript of devotional service to reach North America. Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur was a prolific writer, and his son was the spiritual master of our Guru Maharaj. Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, one of his books was called Dasha Mula Tattva. Dasha means ten. Mula means root. Tattva means truth. So we begin with philosophy. But the philosophy is not speculative. The philosophy is passed down through disciplic succession and it's perfect. You learn the absolute truth first by its philosophy and by the process you're given in order to realize the absolute truth. And the absolute truth is both impersonal and personal, with personal being predominant. But first we begin with philosophy, and that philosophy is called Dasha Mula Tattva, the ten root truths of the absolute truth. Now, Dasha Mula Tattva enumerates ten principles or tattvas. And the first tattva is different from the other nine because the first tattva gives us evidence evincing the proof of the other nine. So we begin with Amnaya, the first tattva of the Dasha Mula Tattva. Amnaya means the sacred knowledge of the Vedic texts culminating in the sacred knowledge of the Vaishnava texts. This is called pramana. It must be received through disciplic succession. Otherwise, it will be vitiated. And this knowledge, when received, lets us have access to pramaya, pramana, evidence evincing proof, gives us access to pramaya, that which is to be proved. And when we say is to be proved, that also begins with knowledge. You receive the knowledge of what is to be proved, but it is directly ascertainable. 
it is directly perceivable in due course of time all of these pramaya or all of these nine truths to be proved in the Dashamula Tattva. But we must begin with Amnaya, the knowledge of the Shruti, which is also called Shabda. That's the Vedic texts. And the Smriti, which are written commentaries on the Vedic texts, such as the Puranas. Essentially, the Shruti and the Smriti are transcendental because they lead to transcendence, because they culminate in the Vaishnava sacred texts. And we are mostly concerned with that. In fact, we're totally concerned with that. And the second tattva of the Dashamula tattva is a description of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Supreme Absolute Truth, which is the goal of the Anaya. Texts 2, 3, and 4 describe that Supreme Absolute Truth, the Personality of Godhead, beyond the effulgence, which is also His, and which is also absolute. Vedanti tattva vidas tattvam yaj jnanam advayam brahmeti paramatmeti pogavaniti shabdite as stated in the second chapter of the first canto of the Bhagavad Purana, 11th verse, the absolute truth is realized as non-dual and it's realized in three stages or three aspects, Brahman, Paramatma and Bhagavan. The ultimate goal is Bhagavan, but all are God realization. The Brahman, referred to there, is also known in Sanskrit as Brahma Jodi, or the impersonal effulgence of the Lord, which is still His effulgence, which is totally spiritual and which is absolute. But it is not the ultimate absolute truth. It is subordinate to the personal feature of the Godhead, as stated clearly. Brahmanohi Pratishtaham of Yayasya Vyasya Cha Shashvatasya Cha Tharmasya Sukasya Katakasya Cha. That's the last verse of Bhagavad Gita, chapter 14, text 26, which means Lord Krishna, who's speaking Bhagavad Gita, is stating that the Brahman effulgence is to him subordinate because he is its foundation, Brahmanohi Pratishtaham. Amritasya, its nectar, Avya Yasya Cha, it is inexhaustible. Shashvatasya, it is eternal. Chatharmasya, Sukasayai Kantakasya Cha, and it is Ananda. Realization of that Brahman is bliss, but it is the beginning of God realization, it's the beginning of the bliss. The bliss increases manifold as we go from Brahman to Paramatma to Bhagavan. And now we are getting in the second tattva of the Dashamula tattva, the description of Bhagavan. And the first st statement of the second Dashamula tattva is Parama. Sri Hari is the Supreme Absolute Truth. We're going to be speaking more about this as this discourse proceeds. Sri Hari is another name of Lord Krishna. Next, number three, Sarva Shakti Man. Sri Hari is omnipotent. No matter how much you may hear propaganda that we're ultimately omnipotent, it is not so. In our pure feature, beyond all conditioning, beyond the Maya Shakti, we are extremely effulgent and extremely powerful, but we are not omnipotent. Sarva Shaktiman, the actual omnipotent, is Sri Hari. Then number four is Akila Rasamri to Sindhu. Sri Hari is the ocean of nectarian mellows. We're all looking for that mellow, that relationship, that perfect taste in dealing with another individual, but that perfection is reached when we attain God realization in his personal form in relationship to the Supreme Lord because he's an ocean of these mellows. So that's numbers 2, 3, and 4, which are the Pramaya, 
to be realized directly perceivable in due course of time. The next three is in relation to a subordinate energy of his, which we are. One, each of us is a spark of that energy. And number five is called Vivanaksha. Vivanaksha means the Lord separated parts and parcels. We have an eternal relationship with him. And this Vivanaksha Tattva of the Dashamula Tattva is an int uh, a very detailed exposition of the intrinsic nature of the Jiva. Another name for Vivanaksha Shakti is Jiva Shakti. When we read the term Jiva Puta, like in the Bhagavad Gita, that refers to the conditioned soul. But Jiva Shakti refers to uh, the vast totality of all souls, spirit souls, that are separated parts and parcels, whether liberated or conditioned, the entire range. Next we go to number six, Buddha Jiva. Buddha Jiva is the conditioned soul. The conditioned soul who has become enslaved by the Maya Shakti. The errant Jiva who has misused free will. The seventh tattva of the Dashamula tattva is called Mukta Jiva. This tattva describes the process of the jiva's complete liberation from the Maya Shakti. The Maya Shakti being the external potency of Maya, the illusory energy of Godhead. The jiva mukta, the mukta jiva, is completely free from the Maya Shakti and has therefore taken shelter of the Chit Shakti the internal spiritual potency of the Lord, which is the eternal proper place of the jiva. As we proceed now through the Dashamula Tattva to the eighth Tattva, we come to a Chintya Peda Veda Tattva, or just simply a Chintya Peda Veda. This is a combination of three Sanskrit words, a Chintya, Peda, and A Peda. And what it means is inconceivable simultaneous difference and non-difference. The inconceivable potency of the Supreme Lord is all-pervading everywhere in both the material and spiritual world. He is present in every aspect of his creation everywhere. At the same time in the material world he is hidden to the realization of the errant jiva. In the Gaudiya Vaishnava line, which is represented by Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada as the last Sampradaya Acharya or in that line, our Guru Maharaj, the philosophy of the Absolute Truth is called a Chintya Peda Veda, Tattva. The philosophy is also called Parinamavad different from Vivartabad or Mayavad, which is the impersonal conclusion. But we shall not, during this discourse, get into a heavy discussion of the impersonal, because there's something more important than that that needs to be understood in our first discourse. So therein we have the description, Pramea, of Tattvas 2 through 8. Now the ninth tattva and the tenth tattva are related but not exactly the same. The ninth tattva is the process to realize all the tattvas and the tenth tattva is the ultimate realization, the ultimate goal. The ninth tattva, the Dashamula tattva, is called Upitheya. So when we were describing just now tattvas two through eight, that is called Sambantha the relationship of the jiva to the Supreme Absolute Truth Personality of Godhead. Those tattvas describe the relationship 
the knowledge of the relationship which can be directly perceived, directly realized. Now the ninth tattva is called Abhithaya. This is the process. Most of you have heard the term Bhakti Yoga. Another synonym for Bhakti Yoga is Bhutti Yoga. Some will protest that Bhutti Yoga is a very, very high realization. That's true. That's very true. But the working principles of Bhutti Yoga are accessible immediately. So therefore the whole process can be called Bhakti Yoga. For example, Shraddha. The process begins with faith, Shraddha. But that faith is soft, Komala Shraddha. It needs to become firm, but in order for it to become firm, that requires significant spiritual and devotional advancement. That doesn't happen overnight or in a day or in a week or in a year. But you begin the process because it's absolute. The cause is already present in the effect, and we're not talking karma here. We're talking spiritual destiny, providence. If you have genuine shraddha, even though it, of course, will be soft in the beginning, that's still shraddha, that's faith. That shraddha and emotion, as we all know, will eventually be transformed into bhava, the emotion of ecstasy and love of Godhead, and then beyond that prema, which is going to be described subsequently in the Dasha Mula Tattva. But what needs to be understood here is that Abhitheya, number nine of the Dasha Mula Tattva, is absolute. It's either present or not present. If it is present, that means that the performance of the seva, seva is a Sanskrit word for the service, because bhakti yoga and buddhi yoga, unlike the other yogas, pivots and depends upon the service attitude of the devotee or transcendentalist. You must have a service attitude to make advancement in Bhutti Yoga, in the working principles of Bhutti Yoga, because that service carries on. It goes up and up until it eventually reaches the topmost position, which is going to be described subsequently as the tenth tattva of the Dashamula tattva. But Abhitaya needs to be understood properly. In the beginning, Abhitaya is called Vaidhi Sadna Bhakti. This Sadna Bhakti is regulated devotional practice adhering to scriptural. Adhering to what the Guru says is to be done and what is not to be done. Because the Guru represents the Shastra. Shastra is a Sanskrit name for the sacred Vedic and Vaishnava literatures. But when you enter into a Vaishnava line, you're far more concerned with the sacred Vaishnava texts than you are with the Vedic texts, because the Vedic t texts are meant to lead you to the Vaishnava texts. That's their whole purpose. Vedaischa saravairaham eva vedyaha, as stated by Lord Krishna and Bhagavad Gita in the 15th chapter. And this can be performed from any position, any stage of realization of Hithaya. It must be. If the idea is put forward, oh no, you can't engage in pure devotional service until you're at a very high level, then how you would reach that high level? You can engage in pure devotional service from the beginning. Not only can you, you must. And that's called Vaiti or Vidhi. Vidhi Bhakti or Vaiti Bhakti. Beyond that is a very advanced stage that's still called sadhana, and that is the stage of spontaneous devotional practice in attachment. The Sanskrit word is asakti in the general. In the Gaudiya Vaishnav line, the Sanskrit term is raganuga sadhana bhakti. It's beyond the vidhi bhakti. But anybody who jumps to the Raganuga prematurely is known as a Sahaja. And anybody who jumps to the stage beyond Raganuga is even a worse Sahaja. Sahaja means a pretender, a bluffer, who pretends to be extremely advanced when actually it is not so. 
in order to make advancement in devotional service, you have to act according to your Utikar, your eligibility. Your Utikar will increase gradually as you act according to it. But you cannot act above it and you should not act below it either. That also produces very negative results. So sadhana, the performance of either regulated uh, devotional practice or the last stage and highest stage of sadhana, the spontaneous devotional practice following in the footsteps of a resident of the transcendental realm. And we are not, of course, going to describe that in any great detail here. But this sadhana bhakti leads to sadhya bhakti, the, do, the two different terms here. Sadhana, the practice, sadhya, the attainment. Everything is downhill when the sadhya is reached, although there still requires some effort because sadhya has stages also. Now, that's the description of abhitheya. So, so far we have the sampantha, which is the description of the relationship, the abhitheya, which is the process of the working principles of bhuti yoga, then we have number 10 of the Dashamula Tattva, Prayojana. Now, Prayojana is described by the Dashamula Tattva as Prema. Prema is not the first stage of satya or attainment, but it's the goal. It's what sadhana is performed for, and it's what bhava is meant to achieve. It's concentrated love of Bhagavan or Sri Krishna, Sri Hari. Such a devotee is extremely advanced transcendentalist, to say the least. And we should note carefully that of these three stages, Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan, realizing the effulgence of God, and that's called God-realization, realizing the Paramatma feature of the Lord, the all-pervading Paramatma feature, and then realizing Bhagavan in a loving relationship, Akila Rasamrita Sindhu, the ocean of nectarian mellows, with Bhagavan, or Sri Hari. Full mystic powers, all 23 of them, including the eight major, the Ashta cities, major mystic powers, that, those are attained previous, just previous, to Paramatma realization. So if somebody is projecting a profile as if they're Bhagavan realized and have reached Prayojana, they should be able to back it up with their powers. Not that they have to necessarily flaunt those powers, but just to give you one example, I could give you many, but in the uh, London Temple at very place, when it was first uh, set up for the altar for the deities, his divine grace through the Prabhupada, who Bhagavan realized, in love with Bhagavan, highest relationship, prayojana fully, as high as you can go. He was doing the first RT performance, the Pujari. And the altar was a, was a double, uh, lower end, lower level, and a higher level. And these deities were all heavy. And it was not constructed rightly by the carpenter. And the second level started to collapse. The weight of that second level would have been, at bare minimum, a half a ton. While performing the RT, his divine grace with his left hand put it under the base or floorboard of the second level and held up the altar. No human being could do that. Now, was that flaunting his mystic powers? Of course not. But it was necessary. At the same time, it was a demonstration. Which leads us then to understand that we must have that Amnaya correct. The first tattva, the Amnaya. The evidence has to be correct. You have to get the evidence right in order to get the realizations that we're all meant to get, in order to get the loving relationship with the Lord that we're all meant to get, in order to get the powers that we're all meant to get. 
If your evidence is flawed, you won't get. You won't secure what is otherwise meant to be available to you. So we're talking of Hithaya, the ninth tattva, the process that begins with chanting the holy name, like just here. Most of you have seen devotees with the bead bag and the beads, 108 beads with 109th bead, the head bead, which you don't chant on. And the chief process of the working principles of Buddha Yoga is chanting the holy name on your beads. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Now, there are other important processes, other important rules and regulations, just to give you a couple. You have to give up killing yourself if you want to make advancement in spiritual life. Either in spiritual life or devotional life, if you're killing yourself, what is that? You can't light a fire by pouring water on it. Killing yourself means engaging in intoxication. Have you ever known this word, intoxication? Have you noticed that toxic is in it? Some may say, well, I get spiritual realizations from it. It changes the brain chemicals to such a way that certain things are shut off and you can come to certain realizations that aren't readily available during the state of waking sleep, which is previous, far previous to self-realization, which itself is previous to God-realization. But it doesn't stay. Well, you can shift the chemicals and you can get those so-called realizations, and even they might be realizations, but you won't keep them. It won't stay. And then what are you left with when you, quote-unquote, come down? You're left with the poisons in your physical body and especially in your brain, destroying the brain cells. So just to give an example, as I say, of one rule and regulation that needs to be followed is not to kill yourself. There's no intoxication allowed if you're going to engage in the working process, the working principles of Buddha Yoga. Buddha Yoga and Bhakti Yoga being syn synonyms. Another is, if you can't, it's not supposed to kill yourself, why should you be killing others? Now, everybody knows that in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, which really should be worded, thou shalt not murder, because that's what he was saying there. That's the intention that the Catholic Church and the other churches say that he had. But really, he used, according to the Bible, thou shalt not kill, meaning perhaps it was not limited to murder. And in our line, it's not limited to murder. Thou shalt not kill means you don't kill other living entities. You don't kill yourself and you don't kill other living entities, which means you must give up eating meat, fish, and eggs. These entities have eyes, they have developed spinal columns or developing spinal columns, and they are not required for sustenance, and they are not granted to the human being for sustenance. His teeth aren't meant for it. Our teeth aren't meant for it. I'm just giving an example of two rules and regulations that need to be followed in the beginning. There's some other beginning principles, but we'll leave it at two for now. In other words, if you want to take to this process, if you want to use the evidence in order to start making progress on realizing the, the pramaya or what is to be proved by the evidence, going through the stages of knowledge and then realization, then there's some rudimentary rules and regulations, and most important, the positive preliminary chanting the Hare Krishna mantra as much as possible every day. An initiative Prabhupada has a minimum rounds that he or she must chant every day, and every initiative Prabhupada knows what that is. But really, let us go back to the second of the Dashamula Tattva. The second Tattva, or principle, is Parama. Sri Hari is the supreme, absolute truth. Truth. Our goal is to realize the absolute truth. How can we realize the absolute truth if we are absorbed in lies on this plane? It is not possible. That is another form of sahajya, pretending to be following the process when the process is not being followed. So many lies. Obviously, we would have to take hours to cover all the lies 
but we need to focus on where the real lies are. Now, of course, there'll be an objection by the purists, and they will say, oh, you've given so far in your discourse all these positive things. Now you're going to go negative. No, the, that can't, you can't reach the absolute best positive place by discussing the negatives. For example, in the early 80s, the New Age, when it was uh, growing exponentially at that time, one of their, you could say, aphorisms was no negativity. But notice, both words are negative. No negativity. The fact is, it is impossible, nor is it ever recommended, that you have to ignore negativities. You must know the negative, you must know the positive. For example, here we have the Sri Isha Upanishad. There's 180, Shupan there's 108 Upanishads, and believe it or not, Bhagavad Gita is also considered one of the Upanishads, but that's a long description of why it is so. It's both, Bhagavad Gita has a unique position in that it's both Shruti and Smriti. It's both an Upanishad and part of the Mahabharata, which is considered to be Smriti. So here we have Mantra 14 in the Sri Isha Upanishad, which means Isho, Isha, first. Okay, it reads, Samvu ting cha vinashang cha yastad vedo payang saha vinashena mrityung tirthva samvu tamritam ashnute. You have to learn the Godhead and transcendence as well as the negative, the temporary material manifestation. You must know both of these in order to transcend death and reach the eternal kingdom. Now that's a loose translation, but it comes to the essence. And the essence is that a transcendentalist has to know how this world is working and the principles of the transcendental world simultaneously, learning both. There's going to be plenty of negativity in any yoga process that's genuine. There's no way to avoid it. Uh, the Buddhists agree with this, the Mayavadis agree with this, the Jains agree with this. There's only a small subsection of Western New Agers that disagree with this, but in practical life you cannot do that. Even when you're driving a vehicle you have to be aware of so many negatives and you have to act on so many negatives. Otherwise you get in an accident which is very negative. So the no negativity mantra or aphorism should be completely rejected. We are going to talk some negatives now. But these negatives are positive. When a knife cuts into a physical body, technically, objectively speaking, you can call that a negative act. But when it takes out an appendix that's just about to burst, the result is extremely positive. That human being lives. In the 19th century, if your appendix burst, you died. Even now it's possible. So the knife and cutting in and taking something out it's a negative act, it's bloody, but it's a good result. It's a positive result. We have to judge by the results in the right way, not the Machiavellian way. Not in the results of power, but in the results of do you come to advance in Krishna consciousness. So this is the application of the time immemorial knowledge. The application for postmodern civilization today. The application is that all of this, which is working against realization of Krishna, can still be understood in the right way, and some of it can be used or dovetailed in your progress on the path of the absolute truth, as long as you have a firm foundation, not a shaky, not a moving foundation, not wobbly. You need a firm foundation. And in being able to get a firm foundation, you've got to know the transcendental positives, and there's plenty, and we've discussed some already. And you have to know the negatives also, because it helps advance in transcendence. So when we say that Sri Hari is omnipotent and the supreme absolute truth, what do we mean by truth? Yes, it means transcendental truth, but it means all truth also. Truth is in the mode of goodness. There are three modes. And although these modes have to be transcended in due course of time through the process of Bhutha Yoga, Abhitaya, the ninth principle, 
Still, the mode of goodness, when combined with abhitheya, devotional practice, adhering to regulated scriptural activities, what's sanctioned by the guru, then you will advance in the mode of goodness and you will advance in seeing the truth, both here as well as at least knowledge of, although some realization will come even early, but knowledge of the absolute truth beyond what is here. As Krishna says in the 14th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Mangchayo of Yapicharena, Vokti Yogena Sevate, Sagunan Samatityaitan, Brahmabhuyaya Kalpate. Even realizing that Brahman, the first stage, Brahmeti Paramatmiti Bhagavan Brahman. When you realize Brahman in true, full realization beyond the river Viraja, which is the last layer of what can be called the material world, very, very far away. The three modes of material nature are totally transcended at that point. Through Bhakti Yoga, through Abhitheya. But previous to that, the mode of goodness is the superior mode. It's the mode of what's called a Brahman. Most of you have heard this term Brahman. Sometimes it's translated as a devotional or spiritual intellectual. Sometimes it's translated with the Sanskrit word Satu or a holy man. A Brahman is a learned individual. Learned in the scripture, has a genuine spiritual master, either as a Diksha Guru or a Shiksha Guru or both, that's preferable. And associates with other devotees, preferably with devotees who have a higher realization than he or she does have. When his divine grace to the prophet came here in September of 1965 and eventually formulated and then formed his incipient organization in the middle of the summer of 1966 in New York City, he was creating a society of Brahmins. Men and women in the mode of goodness engaged in transcendental activity. This mode is wanted in the beginning. Ultimately it's transcended, but when it's transcended, the devotee still acts in goodness with perhaps a rare exception here and there. A rare exception because once spontaneous devotional practice is realized, then the restrictions of the scripture no longer are applicable. Not that a devotee who realizes that high stage of Raga Nuga, as we described previously, will flaunt that. He won't. Someone who flaunts, then you have a Sahaja, a pretender. Now, in regard to the mode of goodness, it's described in Bhagavad Gita by Lord Krishna very clearly in the 18th and final chapter. Samadama tapa shaucham, shanti arjva mevacha, jnana vijnanam astikyam, rama karma svabhavajam. Svabhava means the nature, the character. This is a process of transformation via rejuvenation. If your character is in the lower modes, and we can be quite certain that virtually every Westerner is born in the lower modes and raised in the lower modes and trained in the lower modes and degraded in the lower modes. The lower modes being, being the mode of ignorance and the mode of passion. Uh, we'll describe those in a little bit in not great detail. They need to be transcended as far as possible according to your adhikar, according to your eligibility, your level of realization and personal power. So, samadhamat tapahak shaucham shantir arjavam evacha jnanam vijnanam astikyam. So these are the nine qualities of the Brahman. And Prabhupada wanted to create Brahmins, and he did create Brahmins. What happened after he left is another story. But of these nine qualities, we could go and we could talk about all nine, but I'm just going to talk about one, arjavam. Arjavam means honesty. The Brahmin is an honest man. The Brahmin is an honest woman. And when you're honest, you're truthful. And what is Lord Hari? Sri Hari is the supreme absolute truth. 
We have to get beyond the lies. All the lies that cover the absolute truth at so many different levels. You have to become a Brahmin. And you have to be able to see who is a Brahmin. And you have to be able to see who isn't a Brahmin. Now, even if somebody is in the mode of passion by a Svabhava, and therefore has warrior tendencies, or management or administrative tendencies, still Prabhupada trained them also as Brahmins, which means a combination of a Brahmin and a Kshatriya. Kshatriya is the Sanskrit word for that kind of person, the administrator, the warrior. Vishvamitra was a combination of a Brahmin and a Kshatriya. Kripacharya was also a combination. Dronacharya, so it's there. But still, they were also Brahmins. Even though they were warriors, they were truthful men. And to make advancement to understand the Supreme Absolute Truth requires making advancement as a Brahmin. And that's what this process is about. Uplifting your character through transcendental process, through seva attitude, by linking yourself, yoga, with the Supreme Absolute Truth. Yoga ultimately is a high state, but practicing through the working principles of Buddha Yoga also is a connection to yoga. In other words, if there were no connection, if there wasn't some attachment, if there, suffered, if there wasn't some affection in the very, very beginning, there would be no meaning to the process. The process is about increasing your attachment, increasing your affection, understanding the root principles the root truths of the absolute truths, understanding what can and cannot be used as evidence. Evidence is not totally restricted to amnaya, pratyaksha, anuman, and aitya. These are also these three can also be used as evidence as long as they're truthful, as long as they're factual. They can be used as evidence, which helps you understand the absolute truth. Pratyaksha means direct perception, but direct perception is very faulty. So many false things can be accepted by direct perception, but still, when it's true, it's helpful. Anuman means logic, hypothesis. That also, when it's true, is helpful. And understanding historical realities, which we are going to be discussing in some detail in the monthly discourse for May historical realities in relationship to what has happened after his divine grace through the Prabhupada left us in November of 1977. So Amnaya, the centerpiece, the highest evidence evincing truth is knowledge received through disciplic succession, sometimes called Shruti and sometimes called Shabda, knowledge from the sacred Vaishnav texts. But other knowledge is supplemental and helpful. And how this is all integrated in order for the neophyte devotee to make advancement step by step by step, going through faith, going through higher association is the next step, becoming initiated by a genuine spiritual master is the next step, getting rid of all the unwanted activities and, and speech at the next step, and then on to the next level of devotional activity the intermediate level. We're going to discuss some of these fundamentals and we're going to discuss them in a practical way and we're going to give positive examples and we're going to give negative examples. So until the next time, think about these things.